May shall we start? Yes, sir. We can go. Okay, we have uh, we are starting the contributed uh, presentation. Each speaker will be given 30 minutes for presentation and two minutes for uh, discussion. I invite uh, Professor Ramane from Karnataka University, Darwad, to chair the session. Professor Ramane. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to this, chair this session. Once again, I welcome all the participants for this uh, 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 contributing session, uh, the track one of the second day. Uh, and uh, there will be the 15 minutes total time in which uh, 13 minutes per presentation, uh, 12 minutes per presentation and remaining for the discussion. Uh, may I know that the Anu Vargish is there? The paper number 38, yes. Anu Vargish? Yes. Okay, so I invite uh, Anu Vargish uh, from the Kotam and Civil uh, presenter uh, paper on the distance spectra and energy of some graph classes. So please, we can go ahead. Share your screen, ma'am. Good afternoon to all. First of all, I thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present my research work here. My title is On the Distance Spectra and Energy of Some Graph Classes. A distance matrix is an n by n matrix which is a square matrix with entries d i j, where d i j represents the distance between the vertices v a and v j. And this is a graph and the corresponding distance matrix is present here. Since we are considering only simple graphs, there is no loop, therefore all the diagonal entries will be zero. Since we are con uh, considering undirected graphs, the matrix, distance matrix will be real and it is symmetric and all the distance agent values will be real. The distance agent values, the agent values of the distance matrix is the distance spectrum. The largest distance age value is called the distance spectral radius. And it's an important theorem parent frobenius theorem for symmetric matrices, irredu irre irreducible matrices. And if A is an irreducible matrix, which is non-negative and square matrix, then the spectral radius will be positive and real and will be an agent value of the matrix A. The parent frobenius agent value is the spectral radius of this matrix. And the parent for Venus agent value will be simple, that is, that is of multiplicity one. And corresponding to the parent for Venus agent value, there will be an agent vector with all the components are positive. And this is the unique property of distance spectral radius, spectral radius, and no other agent values have this property. And this is a strongly regular graph. This is Peterson graph, and it's Distance agent values are minus three with multiplicity five, zero with multiplicity four, and 15 with multiplicity one. Here the distance spectral radius is 15, and it is simple. Next is the Srikhande graph. It is also having uh, the distance spectrum minus four with multiplicity six, zero with multiplicity nine, and 24 with multiplicity one. Now come to the definition distance energy. Distance energy is the sum of the absolute values of the distance agent values. 
And a distance metrics have many applications in the design of communication networks, network flow algorithms, graph embedding theory, molecular stability, etc. And the distance spectral radius has applications as molecular descriptor in QSPR modeling and to infer the extent of branching and model boiling points of alkanes. And we have found that the distance metrics have diagonal entries zeros. And so trace of the distance metrics will be zero. And the distance energy is the sum of the absolute values of distance agent values. Therefore, it will be the twice the sum of the positive agent values and will be also equal to minus two times the sum of the negative agent values. And we can see that according to the parent Frobenius theory, the distance energy is always greater than or equal to twice the spectral radius. And equality holds only if the graph is of unique positive agent value. These are some examples for the distance energy of some common classes. This is the distance energy of the path graph Pn and it is approximately 0.6948 n square minus 0.7964. And this distance energy of cycle and that of star distance energy of complete bipartite graph is 4 into m plus n minus 2. And distance energy, distance agent value, distance spectral radius, distance matrices are intensively studied in literature. We consider how the distance energy changes when an edge is deleted. And the similar problem in the case of adjacency energy was studied by Jane Day and Vasimso. They proved that if the edge deleted is a bridge, then the distance energy decreases. And if we consider an induced subgraph, then the adjacency energy, adjacency energy decreases on edge deletion. And also they found that there, are, there exist infinite families of graphs with the property that deleting a certain edge does not change the energy. And there are also infinite ex families of graphs for which deleting an edge will decrease the energy. And also there exist families of graphs for which deleting any edge will increase the energy. And in the case of distance energy, the uh, behavior of the adjacency energy and distance energy are different. We have observed that for a graph with unique positive agent value, the de deletion of an edge increases the distance energy. These are some examples. This is the complete graph with n vertices. On edge deletion, the distance energy increases. And the case of cycle, if we delete an edge, we will get path on n vertices and the distance energy increases on edge deletion. So we commonly found many examples for which distance energy increases on edge deletion. And in the case of complete graph and the cycle, the behavior of the change of distance energy is entirely different. As n tends to infinity, the difference between the distance energy of the edge deleted complete graph and the complete graph. As n tends to infinity, this approaches to zero. But in the case of cycle on edge deletion, the difference in distance energy tends to infinity, as n tends to infinity. And we consider the distance energy of complete bipartite graph. And complete bipartite graphs are graphs with two positive distance agent values. And we have found that this distance energy is always increased on edge deletion. And we have also found examples of graphs for which distance energy decreases on edge deletion. These are some examples. This is the edge E1. If we delete this edge, the distance energy decreases. And in the case of a complete bipartite graph, we have found that uh, 
it have only two positive Asian values. And for complete pi-barter graph, the distance energy is 4 into m plus n minus 2. But on edge deletion, it was difficult to find exact value of the distance energy. But we have compared the distance energy of KMN and its edge deleted graph. The distance age, agent values of KMN are minus two, KMN minus C are minus two with multiplicity M plus N minus four and four other roots, alpha four, alpha three, alpha two, and alpha one, which are roots of the polynomial P of X. This is the result we got that on edge deletion of complete bipartite graph, the distance energy decreases. And in the case of complete multi-partite graph, the distance energy is 4 into n1 plus n2 plus etc. nr minus r. And it is recently proved that the distance energy increases on edge deletion for complete multi-partite graph. These all are my results. Thank you. Any question? Uh, you are done edge deletion. So any edge you can delete from that. Uh, yes, any edge I can delete. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, other than the this uh, class of lab, have you tried for any other? Uh, no. After that, uh, we tried for complete multi-party graph, but uh, now it is brought by. Someone else. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so if there is no any other questions, so let us thank uh, speaker Anuvargis for a nice presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Then we'll move to the next presenter, uh, the abstract paper number C45, and I request uh, Kumi Kobata from uh, uh, Kunda University, Japan. to present our talk and the title is Enumeration of Cyclic Automorphic Hypergraphs. Please, ma'am. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Please unmute. Vice. Sorry. Okay, okay. And giving me an opportunity to give a talk in this conference. Thank you also for your kind arrangement for the schedule of my talk. Our title is Enumeration of Cyclic Automorphic Hypergraph. This is a joint work with Yasuo On. We plan to give a generalization of Nakamoto Shirakura Tazawa theorem. Just Nakamoto. Nakamoto Shirakura Tazawa's theorem is a formula for enumeration on self complementary graphs with a given number of vertices, and it was called Loyal's conjecture. We previously generalized the enumeration to edge colored graphs, namely, we consider the case of edge colored bipartite graph and digraph as well as ordinary graph. Today's talk is for the case of hypergraph. First, we, con we will consider graphs. Let X be a set of N vertices. Let X2 be a set of like this. Y be a set of 1 and minus 1. We consider a map F from X2 to Y. If F of Y there is equal to 1, then there is not an edge between I and J. If F is minus 1, then there is an edge between I and J. This map F is called a graph with N vertices. Find F bar as follows 
for any graph f. For any ij, if f of ij is 1, then f bar of ij is minus 1. If f is minus 1, then f bar is 1. F bar is called a complementary graph of f. In other words, F bar can be understood as a graph obtained by the, by the action multiplying minus 1 for F. If a graph F and its complementary graph F bar are isomorphic with each other, then F is called a self-complementary graph. Here we introduced Nakamoto Shirakura-Kazawa's results, which was on, on, originally called Doyle's conduct. Let's begin with a set of isomorphic classes of graphs that the number of vertices in N is N. Let, let QF be the number of edges of graph F. Let SCN be the number of isomorphic classes of self-complementary graph in Gn. Then they obtain this formula. The right-hand side can be understood as difference of the number of isomorphic classes having even number of edges and auto number edges. We introduce an example when n equals 4. The number of isomorphic classes is 11. Here are the 11 represented. The number of isomorphic classes which have even edges is 6. In fact, we can easily 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They have even number of edges. The remaining five graphs have edges of odd numbers. So the difference of the numbers, namely 6 minus 5, is 1. The formula suggests that, number, that the number of self complementary graphs is 1. In fact, the yellow marked graph is the self-complementary graph. Is, is the self-complementary. Thus, we can confirm this formula is false. Here, we can overwrite their complementary graph by using the other color, like this. Then, this example can be understood as a kind of observation of two colored complete graph. A complete, a complete graph is a graph that adjusts any pair of vertices in X. For the generation here, we consider all colored complete graph. And we treat Nakamoto Kirakura Tazawa's case as the special case of R equals 2. In the next page, we will define cyclic automorphic graph as a generalization of self-complementary graph. After the definition, we will introduce all of results on the number of cyclic automorphic graph. First, we will consider edge colored graph. Let x be vertex set. And X2 be the set of like this. Let zeta r be the r's primitive root of unity. And let z be a cyclic group generated by zeta r. The order of z is r. We consider map f from x2 to z. Let c be the color palette 
just the number of colors is odd. If f of i j is equal to zeta r to the s power, then there is color s of zeta r to the s power between i and j. This map f is called an r colored complete graph with n vertices. So the graph colored by one color is one of r colored complete graph. Next, we will define cyclic automorphic graph. Let sigma be a cyclic permutation of lengths r, like this. We define sigma f by sigma. Like this. For any ij, if f of ij is zeta r to z power, then sigma f becomes zeta r to z s plus 1 power. Then f equal r, zeta r to z s plus then s, s equal r, zeta r to z r plus 1 power is zeta r. The action of sigma to f can be understood as zeta r times f. When f and sigma f are isomorphic, we can f a cyclic automorphic co complete graph. And this is more of the generalization of the pre previous theorem. Let GRN be the set of isomorphic classes of R colored complete graph that the number of vertices is N. Let QSF be the number of edges colored by zeta R to the S power in R colored complete graph F. And let SCRN be the number of isomorphic classes of cyclic automorphic graph. In G, GRN. Then this formula holds. Next, we consider the case of hypergraph. First, we define hypergraph. Let X be a set of n vertices. H is an integer greater than 1. Let x h be the set of Let y be a set of y and minus one. We consider a map f from x h to y. This map f is called an h hypergraph. Here we introduce an example of the case n equal to four and h equal to three. edges and this edge and this edge and this edge are identified. Minus one is adjacent and colored by green. One is not adjacent. Next, we will consider H colored hypergraph. Let X be vertex set. Let X H be the set like this. And let G be a cyclic group generated by zeta. We consider map F of X H to Z. This map F is called an R colored complete H hypergraph with N vertices. This example is the case of N equal 4, H equal 3, R equal 3. These edges of this hypergraph are colored by three colors of zeta 
ゼータスクエア、ゼータキュー、アンドウィーオブテンジステオレ。Let RHN be the set of isomorphic classes of R colored complete H hypergraph. That's the number of vertices is N. Let QSF be the number of edges colored by zeta to the S's power in R colored complete graph F. Let SCRHN be the number of isomorphic classes of cyclic automorphic graph in GRHN. Then we obtain this formula. Here is a remark about its special specialization. Our formula is kind of generalization of Nakamoto Shirakura Tazawa theorem and Ono's theorem. First, by specializing H22, we immediately obtain Ono's theorem. As we explained before, Nakamoto Shirakura Tazawa's case can be understood as the case of two colored complete graphs. So, h equal, r equal to in our theory. We obtain this because zeta 2 is minus 1. So, obtain this. The graph colored by zeta squared is the complementary graph of F. We obtain Nakamoto Chirakura Tazawa's formula. Finally, we introduce the case of n equal 4, r equal 2, h equal 3 as an example of our theorem. This is, this is completely the of the three hypergraphs of the order four. This number are the value of each graph. Some of all these value is one. So our theorem tells us that there exists one cyclic automorphic graph in this list. In fact, this is the only cyclic automorphic graph. So, confirm our theorem for this case. Okay, I would like to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Any question from audience? Uh, no question. Ma'am, you are done for R colored complete graph. So it is for only for complete graph or it can be done for any other graph? Okay, one more. No. Uh, yes, no polynomial. No. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Then. Uh, if there is no any other questions, so let me thank uh, Kumi Kobata for her presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And uh, next, we'll move to the next speaker. Uh, the paper number 08, Soi Satake. Soi Satake? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. So, yeah. Soi Satake, he is from Kumamoto University, Japan, and he is going to talk on uh, on high girth expander graphs with localized eigenvectors. So, please, Soi. Okay. Satake. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, uh, can, you, can you see my slide now? Can you see? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It is, it okay. Is visible, yes. 
Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for introduction. Uh, today I will give a talk about some construction of a high gas air expanded grass with localized vectors, uh, which comes from the study of the expand, uh, recent uh, study of uh, uh, spectral graph theory. And uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to uh, give, uh, present this talk, uh, present talk in this conference. Okay, let's start. So, so usually uh, the, one of the main aims of spectral graph theory is to investigate the properties of graphs uh, uh, from the information of the, its uh, adjacency matrix, adjacency matrix uh, especially the spectra of the, its adjacency matrix. So now we shall focus, in this talk we shall focus on the regular graph cases. And suppose now, uh, so first we will explain about uh, the brooks renaissance graph theorem, uh, which is uh, uh, proved in to 2013. Now suppose we have a difference of regular graph with inverses and let the G denotes such graphs and let the G denotes uh, its agency matrix of the regular graph G. And uh, here we should know that the uh, agency matrix is a real symmetric, I'm sorry, real symmetric matrices. So all eigenvalues of the G is a real. And uh, in this talk, we shall consider only normalizing vectors. So we consider the eigenvectors whose uh, autonomy is equal to one. Okay. Okay, suppose it is. And then uh, for every uh, eigenvector, normalized eigenvector of FG, and for every uh, real number epsilon uh, belongs to the open interval between zero and one. And for every subset of its vertices, B of Z, uh, here B of Z denotes the vertex set of the regular graph Z. Such that the Vs22, uh, which is defined as the sum of the square of Vx, uh, uh, which is denotes, uh, which means uh, uh, the x entry of the uh, the eigenvector V. Um, anyway, the sum of the square is uh, small, uh, greater than or equal to epsilon, and uh, such vector is usually called the s epsilon localized if uh, there is such s. Then we see that the size of s is bounded. Actually, this is uh, at least uh, the CD times uh, epsilon square uh, times d to the power of uh, this value. So the important point is here, S is uh, it's, it's, you know, some information of the eigenvector of FG. And here, uh, the, let's see the index of D. And here, the, the girth of graph appears. I uh, see so here, girth is, uh, and in, girth is defined as the length of the shortest cycle contains the graph T. So, which, which means that uh, there's some uh, brooks Strom theorem shows that there is some uh, relationship between the localized and vector, uh, anyway, some information on the eigenvectors and uh, some geometric information, namely girls, okay? So, in other words, we can also see that from the information of localized and vector, we can also obtain some upper bounds of girls T, okay? Yeah, and here uh, CD, uh, the CD is uh, some constant, positive constant, depends on depends only on the degree D. Okay. Okay. So later, Ganglion and Shribarstava improved the uh, previous theorem, and the and the same setting we see that the, the lower bound S can be improved to the epsilon times d to the power of four over uh, sorry two d square over epsilon times uh, d to the power of this value. Anyway, girls appears again. Okay. Okay. And uh, actually, they also show that uh, uh, their lower bounds is asymptotically optimal. I mean, the index of D is at most uh, large order epsilon of the gas of Z. And to discuss the asymptotic optimality, uh, so we need to find some uh, some infinite families of different regular graphs with high girls. And uh, it is known that for the classical Moore bounds uh, shows that uh, for every Deepersonal regular graph with, sorry, uh, with n vertices, uh, we see that the girls T is bounded by, uh, roughly speaking, at most uh, two to the small order one times uh, log the n. Uh, this means for each fixed D, uh, and uh, we consider the, the case that n tends to infinity. Uh, in this uh, simple situation, gas of G is uh, roughly speaking bounded by two to the small order one times log D the n. So now to discuss the uh, optimality of Gangli Shirvastav's inequality, this one, uh, we consider we need to construct uh, uh, regular graphs whose girth is, uh, has the order around log of the size of graph. Okay. 
So actually, uh, Gangri Shibastava shows that for every epsilon, uh, which is a real number, uh, belongs to the open interval between zero and one, and for every positive integer d, which is greater than or equal to two, then there is there exists infinitely many positive integers m i, and uh, for each i there exists some deeper some regular graph with g, with m i vertices uh, denoted by g i, uh, such that the girth of g i is very large. Okay, and uh, there is some eigenvector with L G I and uh, some subsets uh, of the basic set of G I such that the V S I two two uh, is greater than or equal to epsilon. And uh, on the other hand, the size of S I is, is uh, bounded by this is the power of four epsilon gas of G I. So comparing the previous sliding, uh, sorry, uh, this one, yeah, and here uh, roughly between this is the four epsilon gas of D. But uh, here, as a SI is in, in this graph, SI should be bounded by four epsilon uh, times girth of GI. So this theorem shows that the gangri shirastava inequality in the previous slide, this one, is um, almost optimal uh, up to some positive constants. Okay. But the theorem uh, is uh, derived uh, using, uh, derived by um, some previous construction. So their construction is not explicit construction. And so in 2019, Aaron Gangri Shibasta provides some explicit constructions uh, showing, the, showing the optimality of the Gangri Shibasta inequality. Okay. So suppose uh, uh, epsilon is a uh, uh, real number and belongs to the open interval between 0 and 1. And for every prime d, and uh, we take some uh, uh, arbitrary, arbit any uh, real number alpha belongs to the multiple interval between the one over six. Then uh, again, there is uh, there exist infinite many positive integers and uh, there is d plus one regular graph with my vertices. So that, so anyway, first let's skip, first skip the first condition. But anyway, girth is very large, because it's very large and the same condition, and the, it also, this graph also has the same condition for local eigenvectors. vectors. So anyway, remarkably, they also show that uh, lambda GI, uh, which is denoted, uh, which is defined as the second largest eigenvalue of G, is bounded by, or uh, roughly speaking, bounded by 2.121 uh, times the square root of D. And so uh, this means that uh, uh, the, by considering the Aron Popana theorem, uh, which is appeared, which is mentioned in the yesterday's uh, Professor Sarnak's, uh, Sarnak's talk, uh, this means that uh, this regular graph is uh, actually uh, near Ramanujan graphs, uh, which means uh, this graph has a near optimal spectral gap. So this this regular graph is uh, actually a very nice expanded graphs, and this also has very large girls. So this is very nice, nice expanded graphs. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, how actually is Aron Gangri Shibasta seldom considers uh, uh, express constructions for D plus one regular graphs, but uh, here D is only prime prime. So the main aim of this talk is to extend uh, this theorem to general degrees. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, Okay, now we are ready to mention, uh, explain the, uh, our first main theorem. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, first this, uh, let's forget the uh, first let's forget the uh, uh, condition of for the uh, second largest standing body. So then we see that for every epsilon and for every uh, positive integer d greater than or equal to 29, and for every alpha. Um, uh, which is uh, which belongs to the open interval between zero and zero point one six three. Then there exist infinite many positive integers and uh, d plus one regular graphs, such so that the girls it's the girls is very large and uh, this also holds uh, hold uh, uh, the same property of the localizing vectors. So uh, this uh, gives uh, some express construction of d plus one regular graphs, which shows the optimality of Gangrich reverse inequality for all. D, positive integer D greater than or equal to 29. So, but here there is some trade off. First, we remove the condition for prime, uh, leaving the condition that D should be prime. Here, uh, we replace the condition, we replace it by the condition that D can be any positive integer greater than or equal to 29. But here, uh, alpha, the interval alpha, uh, 
become uh, slightly shorter. Yeah. So this means that uh, the bound of gas of GI is slightly weaker than the iron ganglion sheet of serum. However, uh, comparing, uh, let's go back to the ganglion sheet of serum here. They also derive some bonds. They also derive some construction, and they also derive some bonds for girls. And here is a the constant here, the coefficient of log D is one over eight. But comparing the, this theorem, uh, our theorem shows that uh, our, our, uh, the lower bound of our theorem is uh, still still better than the bound by Gangri Shivastava's bound. Okay. okay. So, okay, so let's uh, move to our second main theorem. Okay, so now we've uh, in some sense, we re, uh, we focus on the, some good for good uh, integers, uh, which is defined as uh, if we say uh, the positive integer D is good if for some there is some prime and there is some t and some prime uh, sorry some positive integer t smaller than p, uh, then uh, such that p minus t the difference p minus t is smaller as um, uh, 0.02 times square t and uh, the d and the d uh, small d is uh, belongs to this interval. Yeah, in this case we say the integer d is good. And uh, suppose the, the integer d is good, and uh, the alpha is belongs to the let's take the alpha uh, which belongs to the open interval between zero and uh, zero point five six three. And then there exist infinite many positive integers and d plus one regular graphs. And the, the, uh, this graph has the same rule of balance for the girls C, and the, this also holds uh, the same condition for the same property for the uh, localizing vectors. And here we can also obtain the uh, upper bounds for the second larger Stangin value. So again, uh, so again, we see that uh, for such good integers, we can construct uh, different of regular graphs, uh, which are near Ramanujan graphs, and which also which also has very large curves. Okay, and uh, the recent result uh, by Roger Hiss Brown in 2019, uh, we see that actually good in almost all good integers. Uh, almost all positive integers are good, uh, sorry. Almost all positive integers are good in the sense that uh, for every epsilon, then the number of uh, good integers greater than 29 is, uh, there are such good integers is uh, at most X is uh, there are uh, good, there are, sorry, there are good integers, uh, at the, which is at the most X is, around uh, the number of such good integers is at least x minus uh, order of epsilon of uh, x to the power of three over five plus some epsilon. Okay, so anyway, almost positive integer is good. So this theorem covers almost all degrees. Okay, anyway, yes. So maybe I have only two minutes, so maybe I will skip the, I will skip the basic idea of the proof. So my, anyway, the largely speaking, our idea depends, uh, crucially relies on the non Ramanujan graphs, which is constructed by Lupotsky, Philip Sarnak in 1988 for every prime plus one degrees, and which also has very large degree. And we also, uh, we also make use of the uh, construction by using, uh, which is found by Choban Martin in 2018, uh, which is uh, done by removing some one factors. Okay, and uh, to show the to show the which degrees are covered in the uh, two theorems, uh, this this is uh, this can be uh, confirmed by using the, some known result on the gaps of between primes. The first result is the first theorem is comes from the Nagra theorem, and uh, the second theorem is comes from the his theorem in 2019. And then uh, we construct some uh, expander graphs. Then apply the technique using parent trees, which is uh, uh, which is established by Arun Ganga Shirbastava, and then we get theorem. Okay. Uh, this is a let us think. This is the basic idea of the theorems, so how to prove the theorems. Okay. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Sutake. Yes. Any question? Any questions? No. Uh, I have one query. Why you take only D plus one regular graph? 
Uh, yes, so actually, uh, first, uh, our, our, our works start from the Brooks linear stress theorem. Actually, they consider D plus one regular growth. Okay. I remember Brooks linear stress actually focus on more general, general class of graphs. However, uh, I think the, as far as I know, there is no result uh, which shows the, the optimality of the corresponding inequality here. Okay. Yeah, so we, we focus on only D plus one regular growth cases. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. So if there is no any other question, so let us thank uh, Soi Sadage for his uh, nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, next, uh, uh, we'll move to the next one. The next uh, speaker is there. Uh, paper number C13, Shubh Singh. Shubh Singh. If Shubh Singh is not there, then we will move to the next uh, paper. The paper abstract number C20, Rasila VA. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So, next paper presenter is Rasila VA from the Cochin University of Science and Technology, and she will talk on bounds on the Steiner Weiner index of curves. So, please, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so, my topic is uh, bounds on Steiner Weiner index of graphs. This is a work done jointly with my guide, Dr. Vivi um, These are the table of contents. First, we use uh, the concepts of distance, trainer distance, and all. Then we move on to our results. We all know what is the distance in graph uh, for a connected graph G. Distance between two vertices is U and B. The length of the shortest path connecting U and B. Or it can be defined as Minimum size of connected subgraph containing both U and V. The Wiener index W of G is defined as summation distance between UV, UV belong to vertex set of G. The first investigation of this distance based graph invariant were done by Harold Wiener in 1947, who realized it as there is a correlation between boiling points of paraffins and their structure. Now, Steiner distance. Steiner distance of a graph reduced by Charton et al. in 1989 as a natural generalization of the graph distance. It is a generalization of the usual concept. We define a stainer tree for that, that is a subset of what of G, a stainer tree uh, connecting S is a subgraph, that is a tree with S subset of what is it of tree. Stainer distance D of S among the surfaces minimum size of connected subgraph containing these words. Now D of S is minimum size of order of E of T such that a subset of vertex set of T where T is a subtree. For example, if you have a graph like this and we take S equal to X, Y, Z, we can have many trees containing these vertices X, Y and Z. These are some examples. Now, Steiner distance minimum size of all the trees containing these vertices. Here it is equal to 4. K Wiener index. Lehmann and Butman proposed a generalization of the Wiener index concept in Steiner distance. Steiner Wiener index is summation of D of a subset of vertices set of G, order of S equal to K. A equal to 2, Steiner Wiener index coincides with the ordinary Wiener index. And SW1 of G equal to 0, SWN of G is equal to n minus 1. We also obtained exact values of Steiner K Wiener index of path, star, complete graph, complete bipartite graph, and sharp lower and upper bounds for SW for connected graphs and all. Also, Steiner Wiener index of products, products are studied. Now we move on to our results. Uh, Literature bounds on the Wiener index of graph was studied by Valiker et al. and Ramani etc. Now here we obtain some bounds on the Steiner Wiener index of graph in terms of chromatic number, vertex connectivity, independence number. Also we obtain bounds on the Steiner Wiener index of four cycle-free graphs. The chromatic number of a graph denoted by chi of G is the minimum number of colors required to color the vertices of G such that no two adjacent vertices get the same color. The set of four vertices with the same color in a coloring of G of the color class 
and no two vertices in a color class are adjacent. Now, complete tripartite graph denoted by K in one line T is a graph whose vertex can be partitioned into C1, etc. Where order of CA is equal to N, such that no two vertices in CA are adjacent. And every vertex of CA is adjacent to every vertex of CJ. Now, lemma says for a T parted graph, K in one, etc. in T, and K of K in one, etc. in T is equal to K minus one in CK plus M I equal to one to T and C K. Now we have a theorem. Let G be a connected graph of order n. K of G is equal to T. C one etc. C T be the color classes of G, where order of C A is equal to N. Then S W K of G greater than or equal to K minus one N C K. Summation I equal to one to T N C K. And the equality holds if and only if I sum up it to K in one etc. In T. This theorem is a generalization of the it says as follows that is the GBI graph of order n k of g is equal to t then w of g greater or equal to n into n minus 2 by 2 plus half summation n i square for i equal to 1 to t and equality holds if g isomorphic to k in 1 x now the vertex connectivity of a graph is defined as minimum number of vertices whose removal from g result are disconnected or real graph a graph G equal to G1, etc. GK is a graph obtained by joining each vertex of G, every vertex of GI plus 1, and is called a join. Now, the theorem let G be a graph of order in connectivity kappa of G is equal to T, which one, etc. HS be the connected components of G minus S, then SWK of G greater or equal to K minus 1 NCK plus summation T equal to 1 to K minus NCT into N minus. L minus PC K minus T. Equality holds if and only if G isomorphic to KL plus KP plus K N minus T. Now, a subset S of vertex at B of G of a graph is independent if no vertices of S are adjacent. And the independence number beta naught of G is the maximum number of vertices in the independent sets in G. And this and it is a result uh, in our literature. Let the connected graph of order n, then w of g greater than or equal to half into n minus one plus beta naught into beta naught minus one. And the equality holds if and if g isomorphic to k beta naught bar plus k minus beta naught, which is the result as follows. G be a connected graph of order n, then SW k of g greater than or equal to k minus one and c k plus beta naught. And the quality holds it and only G is morphic to K beta naught plus K minus beta naught. Now bounds on four free graphs. H free graph is a graph that does not contain H as an induced subgraph. Here we consider triangle and four cycle free graphs. Uh, Peter Dangerman et al. upper bounds for the strain of inner index and average strain and distance of graphs of four and minimum degree delta. Also, he obtained bounds for triangle. Graph. Uh, this section is motivated by the suggestion by Richard Handelman in the private application to obtain bounds for four cycle free graphs. It is a definition by Richard Handelman. Uh, given S at A and C a weight function, C from X to N naught, uh, for Y subset of X, we define C of Y to be the summation C of Y for Y in Y. Define XC to be the set obtained from X by replacing every X. By C of X elements, that is X1, etc., X0 of X, and deleting all Y for which C of Y is equal to 0. And for Y subset of XC, the origin Y is Y star, whose elements are exactly those X belong to X, for which Y is at least one copy. And if X is a uh, vertex set of X and Y subset of XC, D of Y is DG of Y star, uh, also the order of XC is C of X. Then um, weighted state. Inner index can be defined like this as WK of GC is equal to the summation and the subset of BC order of S equal to K. TG of S. Then they have a lemma. Uh, let a tree with vertex at B, C from B to N not be a weight function on the weight set of T such that C will be greater than or equal to C uh, in the total 
rate of vertices of t, then as w k t c, less than or equal to k minus 1 by k plus 1 and plus 1 by c and c k plus c minus 1 by c and c k. Now we have the uh, following graph. Uh, t be a tree and b line graph where 2 of t is equal to 3 and of t. As p the set of vertices of t, s e is a set of edges and s v subset of vertices of s e. Uh, S C the set of series one two. S C subset of edge set of S C. Then D T of S C less than or equal to D L S C plus one less than or equal to D L C plus two. The first part of which is proved by Peter Engelman. Um, now for a series C one is equal to K one two uh, with this is U V W of a triangle for sake of a graph. We denote by T. Hello. Hello, Rasila. No, Rasila, please unmute yourself. Okay. Um, next is the result uh, for connecting angles for cycle three graph of order n and minimum degree delta. As w of t less than or equal to 5 into k minus 1. This is the value uh, which depends on k, n, and delta. As a corollary, we get for general graph is W k of j less than or equal to value and uh, um, k of j is average chain and distance less than k minus 1 by k plus 1, 5 and plus 1 by 3 delta plus 5 in delta minus 1 by 3 delta plus 4 k plus 3. These are the references. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions, suggestion? Ramani? Huh? Yes. I just want to see her slide where she takes a graph and uh, she gives the tree uh, containing the given number of vertices. Huh. That slide I want to see. Uh, so let me show that okay. slide. Which slide is that? So you are giving example, taking a graph and... Uh, yes, sir. Taking the trees with given number of containing given number of vertices, okay. Ah, yeah, this yeah. one. This is yeah. your graph, okay. Yeah. And your well, tree contains x, y, z. Just let look x, y, z. Ah, these are some of uh, trees containing these vertices x, y, and z. I mean uh, that is uh, you are taking spanning tree. Yeah, it is spanning tree. You are taking spanning tree. Because you say containing uh, x, y, z, there's a that uh, tree, uh, I can still have a tree no, containing uh, your x, y, z, but it need not be a spanning tree. But in your calculation... Uh, it is not a spanning tree. It need not be a spanning tree. But in no, this... Uh, because uh, only a tree contains this word x, y, and z. No, I need not contain a word x, w. Okay. That is need not be a spanning tree. It need not be a spanning tree. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. So thank you for your inter very interesting talk. And uh, so you derived some bonds for Steiner Wiener Index, right? And you also mentioned some relationship between some known uh, in graph invariant and uh, Steiner Wiener Index, right? Of, uh, such as chromatic number or index numbers. From your, okay, so my question is, uh, my question may, might be uh, a nice question, however, uh, I want to ask uh, uh, for your, for your, from your bonds of uh, Steiner Wiener index, uh, can you, can you obtain some new bonds for, for example, chromatic number or some independent number, some related uh, graph invariants? Uh, is that, uh, it's not clear for me. No, means he is asking whether you can get the bonds for the other parameters. Means so you have got the bonds for the Steiner index in terms of chromatic yeah, of number. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So we for whether you, from this can you get for chromatic number bound and all that he is asking. Uh, we can try. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. If there is no any other question, so let us thank uh, Rasila for uh, her presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And then you, uh, we'll move to the next uh, speaker. The next paper is uh, abstract number C22. Aniruddha Samantha is there. Aniruddha Samantha. Uh, yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Am I am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Audible, audible. Please. So Aniruddha Samantha is from uh, uh, Department of Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and uh, he's going to talk on some energy bonds for complex unit gain graphs in terms of the vertex cover number. So please. Is my screen visible, sir? Yeah, it is visible. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, good afternoon, all respective professors and my dear friends. Myself, Onirudh Shamanto, a research scholar in the Department of Mathematics, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, under the supervision of Dr. M. Rajesh Kamp. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Today, I'm going to deliver my presentations on some energy bounds of complex unit gain graphs in terms of the vertex cover number. This is a joint work with my supervisor, Dr. M. Rajesh Kalma. And the result in these presentations are taken from our paper, energy, uh, Bounds for the Energy of Complex Unit Gain Graphs, which is recently accepted for publications in the journal, Linear Algebra and its application. So this is the outline uh, of my presentation. So here mainly we saw two bounds, one upper bound, another lower bound in terms of vertex power number with the help of vertex energy. So the broad area of our research is spectral graph theory. So in spectral graph theory, as we know that mainly we are dealing with spectral properties of matrices in terms of their associated graph properties and vice versa. There are different type of matrices can be associated with a graph like adjacency matrix, incidence yes, matrix, Laplacian yes, distance, etc. Your slide is not moving, sir. Uh, uh, you are showing from first slide. Title slide. Is not, it is not moving. It is not moving. Title slide is there. Uh, I'm, I'm again stop sharing and then again start. Okay, okay, okay. Share. Maybe some network issues are there. Yeah. Just a minute. Uh, uh, is that, I mean, uh, is it okay now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now it is okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. I'm sorry for the interruption. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so uh, there are different matrices associated with a graph like adjacency matrix, incidence matrix, Laplacian distance matrix. <clears throat> Among such matrices, adjacency matrix is one of the interesting matrix in spectral graph theory. So here we are interested to look into a new class of matrices that is T gain adjacency matrix. T gain adjacency matrix can be thought of as a generalization of adjacency matrix. So what is T gain graph? So Thomas Zelensky first introduced the concept of G gain graph where G is any finite or infinite group. So what is G gain graph? Before that, we need to know about the gain function. So gain function phi is defined as follows. So G is a simple graph with vertex A, 1, 2, 3 up to N. E, J, K is uh, defined as an oriented edge from the vertex J to K. 
E J bar. This is the collections of all pair of oriented edges E J K and E K J. If there is undirected edge in the graph capital G within the vertices J and K, then each oriented edge E J K assign a value small g coming from the group capital G and which is called the gain of the oriented edges such that the gain of the reverse oriented edges is g inverse. Let us call this assignment by phi. So phi this is a gain functions from the oriented edge set to the group G. So a gain graph. So G is a simple graph. Then a gain graph on capital G is a graph together with a gain function, and sometimes it is denoted by G comma phi. Here G, this is the underlying graph of the gain graph phi. Later on, in ref, consider a particular choice of B. He assume G to be a unit circle and call its associated gain graph as a complex unit gain graph or simply T gain graph. So the gain of a cycle C, this is the product of the gain of its oriented edges. A cycle is called neutral if its gain value is one, and a gain graph is called balanced if its all cycles are neutral. A function from the vertex set of G to a unit circle is called switching function. So two T gain graph phi one and phi two on the same underlying graph G are said to be switching equivalent if there exists a switching function zeta so that one can be switched to the other with the help of the switching function. Now the T gain adjacency matrix or the adjacency matrix of a T gain graph is a n cross n matrix, Hermitian matrix, and its ijth entries is nothing but the gain of the oriented edges from the uh, gain of the edges in the orientations from the vertex i to j and zero other ways. The energy of a T gain graph is the sum of the absolute values of all eigen values of p of phi, and it is denoted by e of phi. So in one example, g is one underlying graph. So here phi one, this is one T gain graph. So in this T gain graph, we can see the gain in this orientation is i. So if you change the gain in this orientation, we have different T gain graph. This is phi two. So in this way, we have uncountable many T gain graph. And associated with each T gain graph, we have unique adjacency matrix. So here, these are the adjacency matrix of phi one, adjacency matrix of phi two, and so on. So in this presentations, our aim is to provide the bounds of energy of such matrices or such T gain graph in terms of the structural properties of G, especially the vertex cover number. So for this purpose, we use the notion of vertex energy for T gain graph. So Octavio Arismendi et al. introduced the concept of energy of a vertex for an undirected graph. So here we extend the notion, extend these notions for T gain graph and establish some of its bounds, which will be used for the purpose of proving one of our main result in the next section. So the energy of a vertex V i of a T gain graph phi is denoted by E phi V i, and it is the ith diagonal entries of mod A phi. Therefore. The energy of a T gain graph phi is the sum of the energies of its vertices. So now, the first theorem: the phi be any connected T gain graph with at least one edge, then the energy of the J vertex, that is V J, is greater than is equal to square root of D J by delta J. Here, D J, this is the J, uh, this is the degree of the vertex V J, and capital delta J, this is the largest vertex degree, and we also characterize the equality. So one corollary: so energy of the vertex V i is greater than is equal to d i by delta j, and equality occurs if it is a balanced complete bipartite graph. So if phi p any T gain graph on a complete bipartite graph K n n, then energy of phi is greater than is equal to 2 n, and equality holds if and only this. Actually, this result will be used for the next section to prove the uh, main up, uh, lower bound. So the, now we are going to the lower bound of E of p. So some graph theoretic definition, as we know the matching number of G. So here it is denoted by mu of G. The vertex cover number of G. This is denoted by tau of G. Suppose phi be any T gain graph on underlying graph G, then the vertex cover number and the matching number of uh, T, uh, matching number of phi is same as that of their underlying graph. So the first main result, let phi be any. T gain graph on G and C of G number of odd cycles and the vertex cover number tau of G. Then the energy of E is greater than is equal to two times tau of G minus two times C of G. And equality occurs if and only if each component of phi is balanced, complete bipartite T gain graph with perfect matching number together with some isolated vertices. 
to prove this main result we need several key results so some of them are so phi b any t gain graph with matching number mu of g then energy of phi is greater than is equal to 2 times mu of g equality occurs if and only phi is balanced complete bipartite t gain graph with perfect matching and together with some isolated vertices so phi b any connected t gain bipartite graph with n vertices then energy of phi is equal to 2 times mu of g and if and only phi is switching equivalent to balanced complete bipartite graph and and if phi is connected t gain graph on some non bipartite graph g then energy of phi is always greater than strictly greater than 2 times mu of g some other lower bounds so first in terms of spectral radius and we characterize the case of equality for the underlying for the uh, underlying graph bipartite graph and another in terms of the uh, uh, gain of the fundamental cycles so this inequality uh, is three now we are going to the upper bound so let us uh, recall some uh, known concept of mixed graph so a graph which contains both directed and undirected edge is called a mixed graph and its hermitian adjacency matrix of a mixed graph uh, or the hermitian adjacency matrix of a digraph here the digraph of the same concept quite so uh, then its hermitian adjacency matrix tj n cross n hermitian matrix and its pq entries is one if within the vertices p and q there is undirected there is a undirected edge if the directions of the edge from p to q then value is i if from q and zero other order particular case of hermitian adjacency matrix and in adjacency matrix and hermitian adjacency matrix directed graph if g is a undirected graph then the energy of then the energy of phi uh, is less than is equal to 2 times tau of g into square root of delta g and equality occurs if and only if g is disjoint union of tau g copies of star together with some isolated vertices later on we and lee extended this inequality for mixed graph uh, so uh, if dg be a mixed graph then the hermitian energy is less than is equal to 2 times tau of g into square root of delta g and he post the equality part as an open problem so characterize all mixed graph which makes the equality in three folds so our final result is to solve this problem completely even for the more bigger context so here we extend the above results for t gain graph and further we characterize all t gain graphs for which upper bound is attained and this characterization completely solve the set open problem so if phi be, be any t gain graph with vertex cover number tau of g and maximum vertex degree delta g then energy of phi is less than is equal to 2 times tau g into square root of delta g and equality occurs if phi is disjoint union of tau g copies of balanced t gain graph and together with some isolated vertices these are the references and this is the paper where the result is taken from <clears throat> okay thank you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, anirudh any questions any question is there from audience okay i have one doubt uh, you are taking uh, this gain graph with directions correct so you may get different uh, uh, gain graphs Uh, uh no sir actually uh, uh, the definition says that i mean in the for the concept of green graph green graph we are not taking basically the direction here so here okay, we okay. consider a undirected edge as a both oriented edge and we define the value in a way that if in one orientation the value is g then the reverse orientation the value is g inverse that is the concept so the okay, graph okay. is basically it's not okay. a, a directed graph it is undirected graph okay Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Mm. So if there is no any other questions, so let us thank Anirudh for his uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anirudh. Thank you. Sir. And then uh, next we will move to the next speaker. Uh, the paper number C forty six. Deepthi Chandran is there? Yes, sir. I am here, sir. Okay. Okay. So Deepthi Chandran she is from the Rajgir School of Engineering and Technology, Kerala. and she is going to talk on some eigen value properties of uniform hyperstar using recurrence relations so please ma'am so can you see the screen sir yeah yeah 
Okay, thank you, sir. First, I thank the organizers for I selecting yeah, me yeah, to present my paper. You can make paper. this uh, full, full screen. You can make, ma'am. One minute, the, sir. Uh, in the view, you can do it. Okay. So is it okay, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, sir. So my paper is some eigenvalue properties of uniform hyperstar using a recurrence relation. So the my outline of my presentation is introduction. Now the characteristic equation of three uniform hyperstar is analyzed, and its eigenvalue properties are proved you know, through proposition. And similarly for K uniform hyperstar. So before uh, defining the hyperstar, uh, the hypergraphs they are the extensions of graphs, uh, which consist of vertices and edges. Uh, but in hypergraph, the edges are named as hyperedges, and it can consist of uh, any number of vertices. Uh, it is a continuous closed curve. So an example is given. Uh, that is uh, three hyper edges are given with uh, e1 e2 e3 and uh, vertices from v1 to v8 are there now uniform hyperstar uh, so uniform hypergraph is a hypergraph in which all the edges will have the same number of vertices now to moving to hyperstar hyperstar is another type of hypergraph in which all the hyper edges it will in intersect at a single vertex and this single vertex is known as the star of the hyperstar. So here a hyperstar is given, and here we can see three uh, hyper edges, and these three hyper edges are intersecting at a single vertex, and this vertex is known as star of the hyperstar. Now moving to K uniform hyperstar. So it is uh, this hyperstar consists of all the uh, consists of hyper edges having same number of vertices, and it is equal to K. And an example is given here that is three uniform hyperstar and here uh, two hyper edges and all are having the same number of vertices equal to three. Now here uh, the coefficients of characteristic equations are studied in this paper and for that neighborhood of vertex is defined. So a neighborhood of a vertex is defined as the collection of vertices in the adjacent hyper edges of VI. The number of vertices of neighborhood of vertex VI is denoted by small n of VI. So uh, uh, to the hypergraph uh, that we have seen earlier, so the neighborhood of vertex of V1, it is, uh, this V1 belongs to E1. So, and this hyper edge is uh, adjacent to this E2 also, it is intersecting with E2. So neighborhood of V1 is V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. And uh, when we uh, define the neighborhood of V4, it is uh, this uh, uh, hyper edge is adjacent to E1 and E2. So neighborhood of V4 is equal to all the vertices from V1 to V8. Now the, the characteristic equation is obtained from the adjacency matrix here. Adjacency matrix is considered here and here uh, the smallest uh, three uniform hyperstar consists of uh, five number of vertices and the next smallest three uniform hyperstar consists of seven. Then the uh, third one will be nine, 11, etc. And generally I represented the number of vertices as two N plus five, where N varies from zero, one, two, three, etc. And correspondingly, the number of edges are two, three, four, etc. Now, uh, uh, for a three uniform hyperstar, I have taken E as the number of edges and N as the number of vertices. And each of the characteristic equations are uh, found out. That is for N equal to five, E equal to two. So this is the three uniform hyperstar with uh, five number of vertices and two edges, two hyper edges. So this is the characteristic equation obtained. Then for N equal to seven, E equal to three. So this is the uh, characteristic equation that is uh, calculated for n equal to 9 equal to 4 this one similarly for n equal to 11 equal to 5 
So now uh, from the adjacency matrix, the rho sum is uh, also equal to n of v i minus one. N of v i means it is the uh, number of vertices in the neighborhood of v i minus one. And some of the observations are obtained. Some of the results are obtained. So minus one is an eigen value for all the characteristic equation, and the constant term is uh, equal to this one minus one raised to e plus one n of v s minus one. V s means the star of the hyperstar. The the coefficient of lambda is uh, obtained like this. Then coefficient of lambda square. Then coefficient of lambda cube. Then coefficient of lambda raised to n minus five is obtained like this, and then uh, coefficient of lambda raised to n minus three, coefficient of lambda raised to n minus two. Now the other uh, nine and ten they are uh, trivial. So that is the coefficient of lambda raised to n. That is uh, since the main diagonal elements of adjacency matrix are zero, it is always zero. So the last is also uh, minus one raised to n. That is also trivial. Now all these observations are tabulated, and we have uh, verified for some number of n and d. So for n and d, uh, we have verified all these results, and they are true. And uh, there is a continuation of the table. And uh, based on this, uh, some of the coefficients are proved through recurrence relation. The general form of an n-degree characteristic equation is taken like this: minus lambda raised to n. Plus c n minus one lambda raised to n minus one plus c n minus two lambda raised to n minus two plus etc. Plus c one lambda plus c naught. So for uh, the coefficient of lambda raised to n minus r is taken as c n minus r, and the sum of eigenvalues of a three uniform hyperstar is zero. That is clear. Now the proposition. All the propositions are uh, proved uh, by mathematical induction. And uh, the, this is the constant term. The, so there is a determinant, and determinant is given by C naught. And this uh, 2k plus 5, it is the number of vertices uh, for a three uniform hyperstar, and it is equal to minus 1 raised to k plus 1 into 2k plus 2. And uh, this is the recurrence relation used here. Uh, it is C naught of 2k plus 5 equal to minus 1 raised to k plus 1 into C naught of 2k plus 3 modulus of Uh, c naught of 2 k plus 3 plus 2 where c naught of 5 is equal to minus 4 and the proof is by mathematical induction now next proposition 2 the sum of the product of two eigen values of a three uniform hyperstar is given by c n minus 2 of that is it is the coefficient of lambda raised to n minus 2 of 2k plus 5 is equal to 3 into k plus 2 where 2 uh, again 2k plus 5 it, uh, it is the number of uh, vertices and uh, then the recurrence relation used is c n minus 2 of 2k plus 5 equal to c n minus 2 of 2k plus 3 plus 3 uh, where c n minus 2 of 5 is equal to 6 so again by mathematical induction now the third proposition is sum of the product of three eigen values of a three uniform hyperstar it is given by c n minus 3 of 2k plus 5 is equal to 2k plus 2 and here the recurrence relation used is uh, c n minus 3 of 2k plus 5 equal to c n minus 3 of 2k plus 3 plus 2 where c n minus 3 of 5 equal to 4 again uh, proved by mathematical induction Then the fourth proposition, the sum of the product of four eigen values of a three uniform hyperstar is c n minus four of two k plus five equal to minus five by two into k plus one k plus two. The recurrence relation is c n minus four of two k plus five equal to modulus of c n minus four of two k plus three plus five into k plus one, where c n minus four of five equal to minus five. Now, fifth one, the sum of the product of five eigen values of a three uniform hyperstar is c n minus five of two k plus five is equal to minus two into k plus one k plus two, and the recurrence relation is c n minus five of two k plus five equal to minus of mod c n minus five of two k plus three plus four into k plus one, where c n minus five of five equal to minus four. Now, uh, moving to k uniform hyperstar, 
and so here the smallest k uniform hyperstar is the three uniform hyperstar we have seen that it, the minimum number of vertex, vertices is equal to five so uh, the general form of number of vertices of a k uniform hyperstar is n equal to m plus one into k minus m plus k minus one where m varies from one to three etc so m are positive integers now here uh, the coefficient of lambda raised to n minus r is taken as p n minus r here n is the number of vertices of k uniform hyperstar now before proving the proposition uh, we have verified for uh, three uniform hyperstar for four uniform hyperstar and for five uniform uniform hyperstar for k equal to 3 already we have seen it earlier and in that i mentioned only two that is we are going to prove the result, these two results only for k uniform hyperstar now for k equal to 4 that is the, for a k uniform hyperstar the uh, smallest number of vertices is 7 so here this is the characteristic equation we obtain and these are the two corresponding coefficient lambda raised to 5 lambda raised to 4. So for n equal to 10, the characteristic equation is like this. And for n equal to 13, we'll be getting like this. Similarly, we have done the same for k equal to 5 also. So we are getting this uh, characteristic equation. Now we are go, uh, we have presented the two propositions. The, that is, we have proved for lambda raised to the coefficient of lambda raised to n minus 2 and lambda raised to n minus 3. And the sum of the product of two eigenvalues of a k uniform hyperstar is given by p n minus 2 of m plus 1 k minus m plus k minus 1. So this represents the number of vertices in a k uniform hyperstar equal to k by 2 into m plus 2 k minus m minus 2. So, sorry, it is repeated, uh, where m equal to uh, 1, 2, 3 with the recurrence relation p n minus 2 of m plus 1 k minus m plus k plus, uh, sorry, k minus 1 is equal to p n minus 2 of m plus 1 k minus m plus k into k minus 1 by 2, where p n minus 2 of 2 k minus 1 equal to k into k minus 1. So, this is also proved by mathematical induction. So uh, we verify this result for k equal to 3 and k equal to 4 and k equal to 5. Now to prove the uh, next proposition that is the coefficient of lambda raised to n minus 3, we define a function s of j and s of j is defined as sigma i equal to 1 to j i into i plus 1 by 2. So uh, so s of 2 and s of 3 is uh, calculated. Now sum of the product of three eigenvalues of a k uniform hyperstar is given by p n minus 3 of m plus 1 k minus m plus k minus 1. So this is the number of uh, vertices of a k uniform hyperstar equal to s into k minus 2, 2 into m plus 1. So here also it is repeated. So uh, sorry, uh, where m equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. Now, uh, the reference relation used is p n minus 3 of s m plus 1 k minus m plus k minus 1 is equal to p n minus 3 of m plus 1 k minus m plus 2 into s of k minus 2, where p n minus 3 of 2 k minus 1 is equal to 4 s into k minus 2. So, similarly, this is proved by mathematical induction. So, these are the results we proved. And the above... Uh, the proportion also verified by taking k equal to 3, 4, 5, etc. So, uh, some of the coefficients of the characteristic equations are generalized using reconciliation and then we uh, move on to k uniform hyperstar and uh, we are aiming to find the eigenvalues of uh, uh, uni uniform, the eigenvalues directly from the uh, uniform hyperstar and then finally from the hyperstar. So these are my references. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Deepthi Chandran. Any question? Can I ask questions? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I want to know how you define the adjacency matrix of a hypergraph. 
one minute. One minute, ma'am. It's not coming to your PPT. Okay. Madam, is it uh, visible screen? Mm. Visible, visible. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, that is. Uh, So here uh, V1, V2, V3. So, uh, so for V1, V1, we put zero. So, I want to know what is the size of the the sensing matrix order. It is equal to the number of vertices. Number of vertices. Okay. Then how you join? How you uh, how you put the entries in AI? How you put the entries? How you put the entry entries in AI join? I didn't understand, ma'am. Entries in the. No, no. What will be the matrix. entries in the matrix? Uh, zeros and one. How, uh, how you put that? Uh, that means uh, you, uh, suppose uh, V one V two. So V one V two it belongs to the uh, hyperid. You know it belongs to a hyperid. So there we will put one. Now if we take uh, V one and V seven, there is no connection. So we will put zero. Okay. Then uh, you take the characteristic polynomial. Is yeah, it? characteristic polynomial. Yes. How? What is the uh, formula to? Uh, Uh, to find its uh, coefficient which formula you are using to find the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial using the structure so using the structure manually i um, uh, find some uh, characteristic equation after that i uh, take the uh, i use matlab for deriving the characteristic equation so from the characteristic the equation i studied the my question is because if you We don't. Uh, Ramana knows very well. Hmm. Okay. Uh, If uh, we you have a graph, then yes. uh, we have a characteristic polynomial, and we have the Jacks formula to find the coefficients. Yeah. yeah. Depending upon the what you call it, uh, linear yeah. graphs. Linear, linear graphs. graphs. Yes. Go ahead. Become easy. Now here, uh, uh, do you have any relation depending upon the structure of the hypergraph? To find its coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. No, uh, for directly it is. Uh, I didn't get any formula. You didn't get any formula. Did you try also? The... Did you try also? I am trying. I am trying, ma'am. Because uh, what I feel. But uh, the thing is that here the hyper edge can consist of any number of vertices. So here we cannot get a specific order for that is specific pattern for for it. So I started with uh, uniform hyperstar. So you are using, uh, you are taking a n cross n. There is a number of verses in the hypergraph. You are taking a matrix yes. and uh, using the MATLAB. Yeah, for complex one, I use the MATLAB. For other than that, I uh, calculated manually. Complex hypergraph, uh, the uh, adjacency matrix will be of high order. And yeah, uh, uh, yes. You can use it, but uh, if I give you a I uh, have even uh, this bigger uh, size, bigger size. Uh, yeah, because because I, bigger size. Yeah. I think uh, what I don't know much about this one. I, I think Ramesh will be able to comment. Yeah, means uh, in uh, ordinary for ordinary this graph, there is a formula to get the uh, coefficients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it is graph theory for the graphs. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, no. minus one raised to r raised to n to two raised to c. Yeah, for a graph, it so is like there. That, whether, Huh. So, like that for hypergraph, whether it is there or you have to try it like no, this. No, 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 not at it, sir. Not at sir. Did you search? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I uh, almost I searched, uh, ma'am, but uh, I am not able to get that. Other thing, uh, what is your smallest uniform hypergraph? Smallest uniform hypergraph. Uniform. That is the uh, three uh, uniform uh, hyperstar. Three. Why That's three? One. I can give you uh, two uniform hypergraph. Two because uh, just the three vertices. That yeah. That is the uh, uniform hypergraph. Why you are taking the uh, five vertices? Uh, that that becomes a graph. No, what every graph is a hypergraph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that is. Uh, so I am not concentrating on graph. So graph is. Ah, uh, yeah. The smallest uniform hypergraph is only on hyper tree is only on five vertices. Yes, 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 ma'am. Even ordinary star also you can take, no? As I. Yes, yes, definitely. Ordinary star is also you can take. Yes, Now, yes. Now from here. See what happens since you are dealing only with stars. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yes. Take yes. the ordinary star. Okay. Uh, then uh, see uh, in order to find that coefficient, 
you see what are will be you are uh, linear subgraphs yes okay. which are the most important uh, uh, no component to find yeah. the correct uh, coefficient the characteristic polynomial so okay. in this case yeah. in graphs that is uh, we the linear hypergraph is on a given number of vertices like suppose 3 the cycle mm -hmm. or k2 yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. But here it will be, uh, I think, uh, hyper edge. Hyper edge. Hyper edge. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So minus one raised to the power something and two raised to the power CL. Hmm. CL is the number of cycles. That, mm -hmm. is, that is no way. That's always one. So minus one raised to the power something you have to find out. Yeah. Oh. So I think uh, that will give, and uh, you are, uh, every graph uh, is a, your. Uh, I will say every star is that you are the uh, smallest uh, uniform yeah, hypergraph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't think we should agree that your smallest uh, uniform hypergraph is on five vertices. Yes, uh, yeah. Ma'am, I told that for uh, with respect to hyperedge, I told that it is the three uniform hyperstar. Yes, once you read uh, Harari, uh, that uh, Burge's book, Burge, yes. even he says oh, uh, every graph is a hypergraph. Hyper Okay, yes, 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 ma'am. Every graph is a hypergraph. So, what happens uh, as results which you come, if you, many results from graphs comes to hypergraphs. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, you have to see the results which is already there for graphs. Yes. Finding the characteristic polynomial and this one, mm -hmm. how to find its coefficient using how far the Zatz formula is going to work. For this hypergraph. Yeah. For yeah. this hypergraph. Hypergraph. That you can think. See. Do you okay, agree okay. with me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct it is. Yeah. Okay. So I because there that are should, that should there give you the clue. Yeah, there are many results for the ordinary graphs, no? So I mean, those yes, results. Okay. Because can, that becomes what happens hmm. if you are uh, this uh, hyper tree has a big one, then hmm. you have spending a lot of time just for a uh, no, using MATLAB. MATLAB, MATLAB I will yeah. say it is a, yeah, yeah. you are not, uh, you, you are not giving, it is a, uh, uh, being a mathematician and working in graph Correct. theory. I will say yeah. then we are working as a clerk. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so if you give more, means in general, if you give, you know, other than the techniques, so means Yes, technology. you try no, to, it will be good. It will be really yeah, can yeah. be generalized too. It's yeah. quite possible for when you find uh, using this, your hyper uh, trees, yeah. You may be able to see that result in terms of graphs. Yeah, yes. First, you can start with this uh, hyper tree, and then you can okay. go for the other. Yeah. Hyper tree, hyper -tree. I think she's taking hyper tree. Let us talk only because there are yeah. no trees. So that uh, uniform, uh, that uh, structure yes. will, will be uh, yeah, taken yeah. from what that, that will be. Which one she can take to that? Yes. Thank you. Definitely, ma'am. Definitely. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So if there is no any more questions, so let us. Uh, Thank uh, Dipti Chandan for our presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you, sir. And then we'll move to the next uh, paper presentation. The paper number is C48, Archana Ingole. Yeah. Hello, sir. Okay. Archana Ingole. So she is from the Pillai College of Engineering in New Panvel, uh, via Mumbai. And she is going to talk on coefficients of characteristic polynomial of squeal Laplace in matrix of some directed graphs. So please, ma'am. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yeah, yeah, it is visible. Yeah, Make it a full you. screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sir. Okay. Yes. yes, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I would like to uh, express my sincere thanks to the organizing committee of the conference for giving me the opportunity to present my paper. Uh, today's my uh, topic is the coefficients of characteristic polynomial of skew Laplacian matrix of some directed graphs. And I have done this, my study under the guidance of Dr. Ujwala Deshmukh. Uh, digraph uh, D with N vertices V1 to Vn and M edges. So let Di plus is equal to D plus. That is a degree sequence, uh, which is out degree. And uh, Di minus is the in degree sequence. And obviously Di is equal to Di plus plus Di minus. Uh, so these are the degree sequence of the out degree, in degree, and the degree of the vertices D respectively. The out adjacency matrix A plus is uh, the matrix AIJ of a digraph D is the N by N matrix where AIJ is equal to one if VI, VJ is an arc and AIJ is zero otherwise. The in adjacency matrix A minus is equal to AIJ of a digraph D is uh, N by N matrix where AIJ is equal to one if VJ, VI is an arc and AIJ equal to zero otherwise. 
And D of G is the diagonal of D1, D2, Dn, where this D plus, D minus, and D of G are the diagonal matrices of vertex uh, out degrees, vertex in degrees, and the vertex degree of the D respectively. So uh, D plus and D minus represents the diagonal matrices of out degrees and the in degrees, and A plus of D and A minus of D represents out adjacency and in adjacency matrix of the diagram D. So A of G, if it is adjacency matrix of the underlying graph G of the diagram D, then uh, it is clear that A of G is equal to A plus of G plus A minus of G. So S of D, that is a skew adjacency matrix, can be defined as S of D is equal to A plus of D minus A minus of D. And the Laplacian matrix is defined as L of G is equal to D of G minus A of G. Skew Laplacian adjacency matrix is S tilde of L of D. So the different notation I'm using for skew Laplacian adjacency matrix. Uh, it is D plus of D minus D minus of D plus A plus of D minus A minus of D. So where this first bracket is denoted by D tilde of D and uh, this is our skew matrix, skew adjacency matrix. Uh, so phi of L of G and phi of S tilde of L of D represents the characteristic polynomial of the respective matrices. So phi of L of G is the characteristic polynomial of a Laplacian matrix and uh, phi of S tilde of L of D represents the skew lap characteristic polynomial of skew Laplacian characteristic polynomial. So recently in 2017, Ji Ming Yu derived the combinatorial expression for the fifth coefficient of characteristic polynomial of Laplacian graph. Uh, later on, Kultas and uh, Singutis investigated the relationship between the coefficients of characteristic polynomial of the adjacency matrix of a graph and a certain graphs. Uh, in paper number seven, uh, there was a study uh, around, about the coefficient of the characteristic polynomial of the adjacency matrix of an arbitrary diagram. And it was derived and it was shown that uh, coefficient of the polynomial of a T count matching. Then again, there was an investigation for signless Laplacian matrix of unicyclic graphs and the Laplacian coefficient of a cyclic graphs. Uh, Oliveria gave the formula for the first four coefficients of the Laplacian characteristic polynomial of graph. So around the, uh, in this my literature survey, I came across that uh, there was a study for uh, coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of a Laplacian matrix, even uh, general matrix and uh, adjacency matrix and even skew matrix. But uh, there was no study for a skew Laplacian adjacency matrix. So I took this as a challenge and I started my study uh, for some special graphs that is a path, cycle and a star graph. So uh, I've started with the reference of this lemma B is equal to Bij, B a matrix with the characteristic polynomial. So phi of B, it is a determinant of Xi minus B. And let SK is equal to trace of B of K. Then the coefficients of phi of B satisfies the following. A1 is minus of S1. And K of AK is minus SK minus A1, SK minus 1, minus A2, SK minus 2. So on minus of AK minus 1, S1. So I tried the first derivation for the path on N vertices. So let G be a simple path with N vertices and M edges. And let D is equal to D1 to Dn, be its degree sequence. Uh, then I could derive the seventh skew Laplacian coefficient uh, for the characteristic polynomial of this path Pn. And this is the derivation I got for, for it, uh, path Pn. So Q6 is equal to 1 by 2, 4 minus 9mn plus 24m minus 3m square plus summation of di square plus 1 by 4 minus 92 plus 29n plus 3m into summation of di square into minus 1 by 8 summation of di cube plus m cube. So um, after finding the path of p of n for path of p of n, I could not generalize the formula. So I tried for a uh, cycle Cn on n vertices. So let G be a simple cycle with m vertices and m edges. Then nth coefficient of skew Laplacian adjacency matrix of cycle is Qn is equal to m upon n by 2 factorial 
into m minus n minus 1, m minus n minus 2, so on m minus n by 2 plus 1, where n is even. So uh, the proof is as follows. So let SK is equal to trace of S tilde L raised to K D tilde. That is from the lemma 2.1. Then the Q0 represents the first coefficient of the characteristic polynomial and it is 1. And Q1 is the second coefficient of characteristic polynomial uh, that is 0 since it is a trace of the matrix S tilde of L of D. Uh, and by calculation now to find out the next coefficient from the lemma D tilde minus S the whole square in this expansion if I derive the trace of all those matrices, so I found that trace of D tilde square is 0, trace of S uh, D tilde equal to trace of D tilde into S, that is 0, but trace of S square, it is minus of 2M. So therefore, trace of D tilde of S, the whole square is minus 2M. Then substituted in that equation, so I got, got that Q2 is equal to M. So this is the third coefficient uh, uh, for cycle CN. Now for the next coefficient, for fourth coefficient of the cycle CN, uh, I have to expand trace of D tilde minus S cube. Now in this cubic expansion, if I find out uh, the trace of each matrix involved in the expression, so in that I found that every uh, trace of this, all these matrices is zero. So it gives the conclusion that Q3 is equal to zero. And to find the next coefficient, I have to expand trace of D tilde minus S raised to four. So for that uh, fourth uh, polynomial, fourth exp power D expansion, uh, the trace of all those matrices in this uh, trace of D tilde cube S and so on these matrices, I got their value as zero. Uh, then trace of D tilde S, D tilde S uh, equal to trace of S into D tilde, uh, D tilde cube. So on all these are, are zero, as well as all these matrices also, it gives me zero. But trace of S raised to four, this gives me six M. So by substituting in this equation, uh, after simplification, I got the fifth coefficient Q4 as M upon two factorial into M minus three. And then the next coefficient Q5 is zero. So, so on for every odd coefficient, I'm going to get it zero. And for even coefficients, I got the expression as M upon for Q6. If we will see here, it is Q6 is M upon three factorial into M minus four into M minus five. So the generalizing the result, Qn is equal to M upon N by two factorial M into N minus one. Oh, oh I'm not doing this. Yeah. Uh, m minus n minus 1 into m minus n minus 2, so on m minus n by 2 plus 1. So um, with the help of various example, I have verified this uh, formula. So here I'm giving one illustration for Cn of n equal to 15 and its skew Laplacian matrix is as follows. So this is a skew Laplacian matrix of a uh, cycle with uh, 15 vertices. So this is the characteristic uh, polynomial of the skew Laplacian adjacency matrix of C, uh, C15. And now we can verify, I have verified all these coefficients with the formula which I have derived. So here uh, Q0 is 1, Q1 is 0. Uh, then you can see that Q3, Q5, Q7, all these coefficients are 0 and Q2 is 15. So if I will see here, Q2 we have derived previously that is as M, that is the number of ages and that is here verified with all the coefficients with the derived formula. So this is about CN. The next I have derived uh, the coefficient for bipartite digraph K1N, directed star. Now here I have considered both cases, uh, edges directed away from the center and the edges directed towards the center. So this is the result for uh, K1 with the edges directed away from the center. So it is ith coefficient of the skew Laplacian matrix is QI is equal to minus M n minus 1, n minus 2, so on, n minus 3, so on, n minus i minus 1 upon i into i minus 2 factorial. So using lemma 2.1, again, q0 is the first coefficient, so it is 1. q1 is the second coefficient, which is the trace of the matrix, so it is 0. Uh, so for this uh, graph, k1, n, this is the skew Laplacian adjacency matrix. And uh, for the next coefficient, the third coefficient, I have to expand d tilde minus s square. And if we will find out the trace of all these matrices included in this expression, I got it here as S2 is 6. So by substituting the equation, we get the value of Q2 as minus 3, which is minus M into N minus 1 upon 2.
So the calculations of all the traces of all the matrices involved in the formula, I got S3 as M into N minus 1 into N minus 2. And so that gives me the next coefficient Q3 as minus M into N minus 1 up into N minus 2 upon I into I minus 2 factorial where I is 3. So continuing in this way and by using the lemma 2.1 and the equation 1, I got the generalized rth coefficient formula for K1n where the uh, age is directed away from the center. So the formula is Qi is equal to minus m into n minus 1 into n minus 2. So on n minus i minus 1 upon i into i minus 2 factorial. So now I'll take the next uh, graph that is uh, K1n where the age is directed towards the center. So for this graph, uh, its ith coefficient of the skew Laplacian adjacency matrix is Qi is equal to minus i raised to i plus 1 into m into n minus 1 into n minus 2, so on n minus i minus 1 upon i into i minus 2 factorial. The, the skew Laplacian adjacency matrix of the bipartite graph K1 whose are directed towards the center. So to derive these coefficients by the lemma 2.1, I got Q2 as minus 3, that is minus m into n minus 1 upon 2. I got Q3 as Am I audible, sir? Audible, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Ah, Q3 is minus 1 raised to i plus 1 into m into n minus 1 into n minus 2 upon i into i minus 2 factorial, where i is 3. And so the generalized formula I derived it QI is equal to minus 1 raised to i plus 1 into m into n minus 1, n minus 2, so on n minus i minus 1 upon i into i minus 2 factorial. So uh, here I have given one derivation. Uh, for K114, having the ages directed towards the center uh, and its Q-Laplacian matrix is this. So the characteristic polynomial of this above matrix is X raised to 15 minus 91 into X raised to 13, so on this minus 13X. So from this characteristic polyma polynomial and the formula which I have derived, I have verified its coefficients. So Q0 is 1, Q1 is 0, Q2 is minus 91, Q3 is 728. All these values I have uh, derived with the help of the formula. I have verified with the help of the formula which I have derived. So these are my references which I have used. Thank you. Thank you, Arjuna. Any question? Our notations are a little bit confusing. Any question? Uh, go to lemma 2.1. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Lemma 2.1. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. But uh, I feel that uh, your all the results use lemma 2.1. Yes, okay? yes, ma'am. Yes. Now, in the third line, you you take a capital S K. Mm -hmm. And when you write its uh, coefficient A1, A2, A3, what happens? You, you use a small s1. Uh, Ah, so, madam is asking what, what is ah, this small, small, is small, it, small, small it, so The is capital, capital S K, because if I replace uh, K by 1 or 2, I will capital S1, capital S2. Mm -hmm. But uh, then you start writing small S1, small S2. Mm -hmm. Are they are different? No, 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 no. It may be the uh, typing mistake, ma'am. It is small S K. Is every, throughout yes. this one, you have typing mistake. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Number yes. one. Number ah. two, when you denote the star. Hmm. You use it, it is K1N, okay? But you yeah. are using small k. Uh, for star graph, huh? okay. That should use capital yeah. K only. It should be capital K. Okay, the theorem, okay, okay, ma'am, okay. This is everywhere, here also, then then also. Other thing, yeah. it goes because these uh, lines, they, they become uh, very much uh, confusing, you know? Okay, Under, okay, ma'am, I'll do, I'll do that change, okay. Other thing, uh, uh, see, what happens... Uh, in a, if a, of course uh, here you have a, you have taken a bipartite graph that does not have cycles, hmm. yeah. and uh, if you look at the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, hmm. every coefficient 
Hmm. If uh, if you have a cycle, they will give you it in number of edges or number of triangles and all other things. Hmm. So here, uh, can you in your uh, uh, this one, can you tell me what is that x raised the power n, which will give you the number of lines? Um, uh, where, ma'am? Uh, the x raised uh, in the polynomial. In the polynomial, okay. Yeah. Ha, here. Yes. Ha, this is a characteristic polynomial, ma'am. Yeah, which which uh, term which term in this one mm -hmm. will show you that it has so many edges? This uh, x raised to fifteen. This is a fifteenth degree polynomial. Yes. Huh? Okay, can you give me a term which will mm -hmm. say this coefficient is the number of edges in the graph? Which coefficient gives the number of edges in a graph? Uh, uh, number of edges. Yes. Ah, number of edges. Yeah. So Q zero is the first coefficient of x raised to fifteen, but and Q1, this x Q one, yeah. Q two, Q three, and so on up to the order whatever Q Q fifteen, ha. Which one will give you the number of edges? So the total uh, fifteen coefficients are exist here, na ma'am. So uh, because uh, there are fifteen edges in the graph. Yeah. Okay. What happens? What I see. You go back. You go look back at the Zach's formula. Okay, mm -hmm. pick up his book on spectral graph theory. There are two yeah. things on spectral graph theory and study uh, the nature of the coefficient in terms of the graph structure. Okay. 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 To make you clear what we have asked you. Uh huh. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, okay. ma'am. Okay. 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 Any other question? No question. Uh, I have one doubt. In the by star, you took a no, directed star. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you have taken the direction coming inside, and then direction going outside. Yes, okay. yes, sir. In one time, you have taken inside, one time going out. Whether it is mixed, can you take mixed one? Means some edges are coming inside, some edges are going then out. Then that will be then that will be oriented graph, sir. I have taken the directed graph. So I have considered the edges first time. It is uh, towards the center, and then uh, going out towards the center. Ah, so What the is the difference between the direction? So that I am that I am studying now. That I am mm. studying now. That if I will change the direction of some of the edge, then uh, what will be the uh, difference? It means what will be the change in the uh, relation between the coefficient of mm. the characteristic polynomial? So mm. that yeah. study is I am doing now. Okay, so because if you take that, uh, then it will be more general than the these two. Yes, okay? yes, yes, sir. Yes, Any, sir. Uh, Ramne, uh, I want to ask the uh, uh, ask her what uh, she does mean. Uh, what does she mean by directed graph and oriented? And, uh, oriented graphs. Ah, uh, is there any same. difference? They are same only. They are both are same. What okay. is the difference between your uh, directed graph and oriented uh, okay. graph? Please specify. It is it is same, ma'am. Uh, but if I want to see uh, in a K one in bipartite graph, if I am having now as uh, Ramne sir told me that I have considered all the edges directed towards the center. Mm -hmm. So if I want to change the direction of any one edge, mm -hmm. so that that I am giving the orientation to that edge. That is giving. Not, that is one of the diagram on that. One of the diagram. Yeah, yeah. One that is uh, yeah. One actually, that is one of the diagram only. Not, not oriented. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, okay. don't say oriented. Uh, uh, I can give orientation depending on the labels of the vertices and yeah. all other things. No. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And my orientation will be fixed. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. your director means you are taking a star. Hmm. That that is a, is the center point is a source or a sink. Hmm. Yes. That's all. Yeah. But you have to consider when it is neither a source nor a sink. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Okay. So please keep okay. in mind that. And there is one question in the chat box. Means he is uh, requested to show the references once again. Please yeah. Show sure. Show the references. Sure. Sure. I will share my, my screen again. My RP Kedi. She has asked references. Huh? Yes. Okay. So RP Kedi, please see this references.
ਸਾਰਤੀ ਕਿਹੜੀ ਓਕੇ ਸਪਾਈਨ ਰੈਂਕ ਓਕੇ ਓਕੇ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਸਰ ਓਕੇ ਸੋ ਲੈਟ ਅਸ ਥੈਂਕ ਅਰਚਨਾ ਇੰਗਲੇ ਫॉर ਹਰ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਮੈਮ ਦੈਨ ਵੀ ਵਿਲ ਮੂਵ ਟੂ ਦ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਸਪੀਕਰ ਦ ਪੇਪਰ ਨੰਬਰ 61 ਵਿਨਾਇਕ ਜੋਸ਼ੀ ਯੈਸ ਸਰ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ okay so vinayak jesi he is from the savitribai phule pune university and he is going to talk on frankel conjecture and lattice derived from reduced semi groups please sir yeah thank you sir am i audible audible okay. sir yeah thank you uh, today i will talk about uh, frankel's conjecture and lattices derived from reduced semi groups uh if you look at uh, the example if i consider the x equal to say 1 2 3 3 and f0 is a family of subsets of x i say 2 to the power x or f1 or f2 you can see that all these families are union closed so what do we mean by union closed so f be a collection of subsets of a finite set x such that f union g is there whenever f and g are in the collection that means then that f family f will be called as union closed family and further you can see that uh, in f1 if i look at the number 1 which is colored in red uh, which appears in exactly half of the sets if i look at f2 then you can see that number 2 which is colored in again red is again at least half of the times of the cardinality of f2 is there so let us go to the little bigger union closed family now here i'm looking at the uh, union closed family of 25 sets that is the member sets and the ground set x is my 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 now here 4 represents singleton 4 5 represent singleton 5 and so on so forth so you can see that this four number which is colored in red again appeared at least half of the family uh, at least half of the cardinality of this union closed family in 1979 uh, peter frankel considered the following known as union closed sets conjecture or frankel's conjecture if f is a union closed family with the cardinality greater than or equal to 2 then there is an element x in x that is the ground set such that it appears at least half of the members of this family this is the union set conjecture you can see that the statement is uh, very simple but uh, till this conjecture is open uh, if i look at the power set this is a union closed family naturally and where the conjecture is tight that means every element appears exactly half of the member states and some preliminary results i can quote if in f that is the collection of all subsets of a ground set x if singletons are there then yes uh, the union set conjecture is true or you can say that if double turns are there yes again answer is yes that means it satisfies frankel's conjecture or union sets close conjecture but despite this elementary uh, statement union close sets conjecture is considered to be one of the difficult problems in external theory and this conjecture is even unsolved though some partial answers are obtained of course uh, to get the partial solutions two main approaches are used one is the combinatorial argument and second one is the use of lattice theoretic methods throughout my talk all lattices are assumed to be finite and the terms which are not defined uh, the reader may refer to gretzer's book and punen seems to be the first one who formulated this conjecture the equivalent form of this conjecture in the language of lattice theory what it says uh if you consider a finite lattice with cardinality greater than or equal to 2 then there is a joint irreducible element say j what is the joint irreducible element it cannot be written as joint of two distinct element that means if j is equal to a join b then necessarily either j is a or j is b then that j element we called as a joint irreducible element so what uh, conjecture says that there is a joint irreducible element j such that the cardinality of filter generated by j this is the set this set is called as the filter generated by j that is set of those x in l which are above j 
that cardinality will be less equal cardinality of half of the cardinality of L. And this paper uh, appeared in 1992 in JCTA. So this is the starting point, the equivalent uh, formulation of union clause set conjecture in the language of lattice theory. And then many uh, researcher adopted this uh, conjecture. And uh, let us give the current status. Uh, this, this is a class equation diagram. I'm just trying to illustrate the idea. Uh, if the lattice is, you can see that D star here. Okay, D star here. So this D star stands for a class of distributive lattices and this result, that means uh, the class of distributive lattices satisfies Frankel's conjecture or union sets close conjecture. This was proved by uh, Punen in 1992. Then uh, next was uh, by Abe uh, in 1998, the class of modular lattices, that is a more general class than class of distributive lattices. Uh, in 2009, 2009 the, in the uh, paper of uh, graphs and combinatrix, we have proved that the conjecture is true for the class of dual covering property, lattices satisfying dual covering property. And so you can see that too many classes comes under umbrella. And this in fact uh, generalizes or extended the results of almost nine papers. So this was the work we did in 2009. Recently, uh, we proved the conjecture for the class of dismantle level lattices. Uh, basically, the class of planar upper submodular lattices, Zedley and Smith proved the conjecture and the proof was too long, around nine pages. And recently, uh, we proved this for more general class than planar upper submodular lattices, namely the dismantle lattices and our proof is that way short and now here you can see that the conjecture is uh, open for two distributive also this is what a little bit of current status of Frankel's conjecture in terms of lattice theoretic methods. Uh, in a very recent paper by Abdullahi, Woodruff and Zaimi uh, they proved the conjecture for subgroup lattices. That means lattices which are derived from algebraic structure. And they proved that if G is a finite group and LG is the lattice of all subgroups of a group G, then LG satisfies Frankel's conjecture. And this motivated us to look at the lattices which are derived from algebraic structure. And we consider the class of reduced semigroups. Uh, we define uh, one partial order on the reduced semigroup, obtain one lattice uh, structure out of reduced semigroups and then prove that the conjecture is true for uh, these class of lattices. Let me go a little bit more detail. If I consider R to be a commutative ring with unity and LR stands for the lattice of all ideals of uh, ring R, then you can check that this lattice is a modular lattice and for modular lattices, the conjecture is true. That means Lattices which are derived from uh, ideals of commutative ring, the conjecture is true in other words. Okay. Uh, these are the some standard definitions which are uh, already known. Uh, nilpotent element, then uh, reduced semi-group, then annihilator condition. Uh, we say that uh, a commutative semi-group is uh, said to have annihilator condition. If I take any arbitrary two elements X and Y, there is an element A such that annihilator of A is same as uh, annihilator of X intersection, annihilator of Y, where annihilator of A is a set of those X such that AX is zero. And we say that a lattice is zero distributive. If A mid B is zero, A mid C is zero, then A mid B join C is zero. That means sort of distributivity holds for uh, zero only. And this definition was given by Warley in 1968. Uh, while working on zero divisor graphs, uh, what we proved is, uh, this is a recent paper with uh, John Lagrange and my student Sarika Devare. Uh, if S is a multiplicative reduced semi-group, you can consider a relation tilde on uh, S, A tilde B, if and only if n letter of A is same as n letter of B, then you define a partial order and relation less equal, X is less equal Y, if and only if annihilator of y is properly contained in annihilator of x or 
if annihilator of x is equal to annihilator of y, then x is less equal to y in a fixed well order on the set of uh, set x that is equivalence class of x. Then we can check that this is a partial order on x. Not only that, we further observe that if uh, s uh, s is a reduced semi group that is with zero. A B is zero if and only if A mid B is zero. That means S you can treat as a semi-group at one hand. On the other hand, you can treat S as a mid semilattice. Further, if S satisfies annihilator conditions, then in that case, uh, S will have some good structure that is known as the zero distributivity. And moreover, if S is finite with one satisfying A C, then S becomes a pseudo-complementary lattice. So from a subgroup reduced uh, subgroup which is a finite with 0 1 satisfying ac we can construct a pseudo complemented lattice now henceforth s will denote the class of finite reduced semi groups with 0 1 satisfying uh, the annihilator condition and the lattice is derived as we have discussed in lemma 3 from s are denoted by l suffix s the first observation what we have, if L is a finite, uh, let L belongs to LS, that is uh, for some finite reduced commutative semigroup S with zero and one satisfying AC, and let S dash be a mid semilattice, which is derived from this, then S is also reduced. In fact, being a mid semilattice, you can check that it is idempotent. That means A mid A is uh, A again. It's a commutative semigroup with zero one. Again, that satisfies AC because in zero distributive lattices, the annihilator condition is always true. And uh, we can go to and fro, that means from L we can construct S dash and from S dash again we can construct a lattice say L dash, both are isomorphic in some sense. Uh, there is a very nice uh, notation or uh, concept known as the deletable element. So you take an element X of a finite lattice when we say that uh, X is deletable, if L minus X is first of all a lattice and it satisfies the uh, properties of the original lattice. And we say that the class is reducible from uh, reducible if from each lattice to this class admits one element. That means we can go one by one deletion and ultimately we will reach to uh, trivial lattices. Uh, this is a uh, theorem by Bordalo. It says that if X is a W irreducible element of a pseudo complementary lattice, then if you throw it out, whatever you are getting is again a pseudo complementary lattice. In fact, it's a sub lattice. So, in other words, the class of pseudo complementary lattices is reducible. And with this preparation, uh, we are ready to prove our main reason that is the class LS of lattices derived from the reduced semi groups with 0, 1 satisfying annihilator condition. Of course, I'm assuming uh, yes to be finite. These lattices satisfy Frankel's conjecture. So, of course, the, uh, just let me give you the brief uh, skeleton of the proof. Proof is a little long. Uh, we are using induction since S is finite and whatever LS, that is the lattice which derived from S, will be a pseudo complemented lattice. And as pseudo complemented lattices are reducible, that means we can get one deletable element, we will throw it out, apply the induction on say L dash. So A is a, uh, what you can say, a deletable element. So apply the induction on L dash, you will get a joint reducible element of L dash. Keep in mind that joint reducible elements of L dash and L need not be same. But we have proved that in this case, both are same. So it becomes a joint reducible element of LS with the given property. That means the filter generated by the cardinality of filter generated by this J uh, will be at least, uh, sorry, at most half of the cardinality of L by two. So this completes the uh, skeleton of the proof. Let me go to the one more uh, class, the class of multiplicative lattices. What do you mean by multiplicative lattice? A complete lattice? means uh, where we have the meet and join of any arbitrary set do exist. And we do have a third binary operation on L, that is the multiplication, which is commutative, associative, and dot distributes over arbitrary join and A dot A 
uh, a dot one is a for all a. And what we have proved that every multiplicative lattice satisfies Frankel's conjecture. Not only that, if L is a multiplicative lattice such that the cardinality of J is exactly half of the cardinality of L for every genuine suitable element, then L becomes bully. So uh, if I consider the lattice of all ideals of a commutative ring R, it is a multiplicative lattice. Or if I consider the lattice of all ideals of a commutative semigroup, then again it's a multiplicative lattice. So in general, what we have proved that uh, the class of multiplicative lattices satisfies Frankel's conjecture. This covers a major class. Uh, those who are interested in the Frankel's conjecture, there is a very nice uh, survey article by Brun and Short. Um, and recently, the union set closed conjecture is a part of Polymath project. And very great mathematicians are the administrators of this Polymath project. Uh, these are some references. Uh, which talks about Frankel's conjecture in terms of uh, lattices. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, any question from audience? Any question? Question. So you told uh, the principle for multiplicative lattices it is true. So like that for uh, some uh, any other lattice it is true. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, just so is it visible now? Ha. Huh, yeah. Hmm. So uh, initial construction work for uh, just look at this uh, class of distributive lattices. Can you see okay. this? These yeah. Star? Okay, okay. Huh. In modular, we proved hmm. it here. Okay. Huh. Class of uh, what you can say, uh, lattices satisfying dual covering property. That is the this class, okay. the first one. Okay, and because of that, uh, all these classes become a corollary of that. Almost nine papers become a corollary of this result. Okay. And uh, the recent result by uh, for subgroup lattices. They used a similar technique what we have uh, used in uh, this proof. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we proved a, to a whatever we can say that is the most general class of lattices okay. known till date. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, classes comes as, uh, under umbrella. Okay, 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 sir. So if there is no any other question. So let us thank uh, Vinay Joshi for his uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so there is one speaker left. Uh, once again, I call the paper number C13. Shubha Singh is there. Shubha Singh. Paper number C13. Shubha Singh. If it is not there, then. Uh, once again, I thank all the participants and the speakers for the, their active participation in this. And uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I thank all of you for this. And I thank the uh, organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to chair this session. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kamnay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, to see for the preliminary talk by Mr. Kamnay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Is there any announcement? Ramani? Uh, no announcement, ma'am. So next no, session we will start as a... The meeting. Can we leave the meeting? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, next session, we'll, next session we'll take uh, as per the schedule. Okay. <laughs>